So this is our temporal bone. See it? It's the lateral surface. It is medial surface. And this is the external auditory canal. This is the mastoid process. So if I hold it like this, this is the left temporal bone. Now, what are the parts of temporal bone? It has five parts. This one is the squamous part. This is the squamous part. And this is tympanic part. This is mastoid part. On the medial surface, this is the petrous part. And there is another part which is styloid part which uh, arises from here and uh, it has been uh, broken so a styloid process arises from here now if i go to the description of the bone the major part of the bone is formed by the squamous part this one is the squamous part of the temporal bone this is gigomatic process Jagometic process is actually a part of a uh, squamous part of temporal bone. So this is jagometic process. This is the root of the jagometic process and the root of the jagometic process is swollen to form posterior jagometic tubercle. Then it becomes thinned out to form the glenoid fossa for articulation of the head of the mandible. Then again it thickens and forms a swelling which is called anterior gigomatic tubercle and the gigomatic process ends here by joining with the gigomatic bone this is external auditory canal posterior to the external auditory canal the gigomatic process can be traced as a somewhat faint line and this is called supramastoid crest this indicates the level of middle cranial fossa. Now on the posterior superior border of the external auditory canal a protrusion can be seen which is known as a spine of Henle. If I take it closer you can see this one is the spine of Henle. Now come to the mastoid portion. This is the mastoid process. Remember that the mastoid process serves as anterior part of attachment of sternocleidomastoid muscle. And on the medial surface of the mastoid process, there is a groove which is called digastric groove. See it? This is mastoid process. This uh, lies laterally. And on medial aspect, there is a groove. This groove. This is known as digastric ridge. From here, posterior belly of digastric muscle originates. And if I trace digastric ridge forward, I will see a foramen. This is known as stylomastoid foramen, from which facial nerve exits. And anterior to the foramen is the, and this is the styloid process. This should be longer, but it has been broken. So this is the lateral part. This is medial part. This is the anterior part. And this is the inferior part. And this stylomastoid foramen lies on the anterior aspect of the digastric muscle posterior to the styloid process. Here the medial ear can be seen from the external auditory canal. Immediately below the middle ear cavity, the depression is known as jugular fossa, which lodges the jugular valve. This one is the jugular fossa. So this is jugular fossa, and anterior to jugular fossa, this is foramen for internal carotid artery. This foramen is separated from jugular fossa by a thin plate of bone which is known as jugulocarotic spine. Through this jugulocarotic spine, there is a canal. This is canal for passage of Jacobson's nerve 
into the tympanic cavity. Look on the medial aspect, the most prominent feature is the petrous part of the temporal bone. This is the petrous part of the temporal bone. This is directed anteromedially. This is the base. The base is formed by semicircular canal, cochlea, vestibule, and carotid artery. The apex of petrous bone forms part of foramen lacerum. Through this apex, the internal carotid artery exits the petrous bone. This is the impression for Meckel's cave. This is groove for superior petrosal sinus. It separates the petrous bone into the superior surface and the posterior surface. The superior surface forms part of the medial cranial cavity and the posterior surface of the petrous bone form parts of the posterior cranial cavity. On posterior surface, this is groove for sigmoid sinus and this is the impression for endolymphatic duct. The another important landmark on the posterior surface is the opening for internal auditory canal that is internal auditory matus. This region is the tympanic region of the temporal bone and it forms major part of the anterior and posterior wall of the external auditory canal. On the inferior edge of the tympanic bone there is a styloid process. I better point with the pain this one is the styloid process arising from the Infra aspect of the tympanic bone. Two suture lines separate the tympanic bone from squamous bone and the mastoid bone. The one is one is tympan squamous suture line, and another is tympanomastoid suture line. Now, before drilling the mastoid bone, two important landmarks should be known. One is triangle of attack and another is McEwan's triangle. The triangle of attack is the area to drill and it is bounded superiorly by linear temporalis then a tangential line along the external auditory canal then another line joining these two line along the sigmoid sinus this area should be drilled for and this is the triangle of attack. But McEwan's triangle is a much smaller area. It is bounded superiorly by linear temporalis, anterior inferiorly by spine of Henle or auditory canal and another line joining these two lines. So this is small area is McEwan's triangle. So what is the importance of McEwan's triangle? The importance is that mastoid antrum that is the largest mastoid air cell is located 12 millimeter to 15 millimeter deep to this level. If we drill 12 millimeter to 15 millimeter from this level then we will get mastoid antrum. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.